My name is Brian, and, uh, and I make booze. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's not actually why they invited me out here to talk, though. Uh, they invited me out to talk because I also made a time machine. Um, although mine doesn't transport people. So unlike this one from the movie where it transports people back in time, mine transports booze back in time. <laughs> um, in fact, actually, uh, this is what we made using it when we did our first pilot run of the product and released it out into the world to get critical reviews and test the water. Uh, it produces the same effect in six days that takes 20 years in a cellar to produce. And, uh, and we were actually able to substantiate it using forensic chemistry. So uh, what you're looking at up here, the, the pink bars are each one of the different molecules that we're measuring on the, or on the chromatogram compared to the black. And the black is a 33-year-old control. Um, and the pink is our six-day-old product. And so we were actually able to match it through 600 molecules to a 20-year-old bottle of booze, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. The other thing that's interesting about me is that I'm not actually a chemist. Well, not at least formally. Um, everything I know, uh, I picked up from Google. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, my story starts with my first problem. So this was high school, um, Salinas High in California. And I was a really socially awkward kid. I didn't have a girlfriend when I was like 16. You know, life was tough, because that's kind of the only thing you care about when you're 16. Um, <laughs> And then at some point, right around that age, I discovered booze. <laughs> and, uh, and this had a really dramatic and amazing effect. I mean, you could take an event that had sort of a, a hopeful outcome, like a prom date, and, uh, and add booze, and all of a sudden, you got much better measurable outcomes out of these events. <laughs> um, the, uh, but this was a problem because I was born here. Um, <laughs> And unlike the rest of the civilized world shown in blue, where you can be 18 and drink, and if you're 16, you know an 18-year-old somewhere, right? Um, but these countries in red are the sort of draconian ones, and the US happens to be one of them along like, like Pakistan. You have to be 21 <laughs> to, to drink legally. So, uh, so I had to solve this problem. And, uh, and so I did the only thing you would do, which is I went to my brand new snazzy computer and went to the latest, greatest technology, which back then was a site called AltaVista that those of you who are younger than I am will not remember. Um, and, I, and I just searched for how to make rum. So I thought, well, how hard can it be, right? And, and that took me to a different search, which was how to make a still. So this was a problem because these are expensive, right? Um, you know, either a glass lab still or a copper still is big bucks. So, uh, so I got a bottle of empty booze from my dad's liquor cabinet and a champagne cork out of the drawer, and took a cordless drill, or corded in this photo, and, uh, and drilled a hole through it, stuck some quarter-inch copper tubing through it, coiled that up, ran it out of the bottom of a hole drilled in a five-gallon bucket, filled it with water, siliconed everything up, and put it on a hot plate. And, <laughs> and, uh, and this was good. It was functional. It made perhaps a touch on the dangerous side. But, <laughs> um, but, uh, but it worked, right? Um, and so then I just needed to go to the grocery store and get some bread yeast, a tub of molasses, and a paint bucket. And, uh, and problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this vastly increased the next two years, the quality of life for the next two years of my high school career. Um, so that was pretty much it for distilling booze. I was done with that, went off to college. And, and then I was sitting on a friend's toilet, reading GQ. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And in the back of the magazine, there was an article about absinthe. And I thought, oh, this is cool. And it was saying in the article that it was the stuff Van Gogh was drinking when he cut his ear off. And, uh, and so I was an art major, and I thought, I need this in my life. <laughs> so, so I did the only natural thing you would do, because absinthe was illegal in the United States. And that was I went to Yahoo, because Alta Vista was gone. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, hey, how do you make absinthe? <laughs> and, uh, so I broke out. <laughs> so I, I got all my parts together, and, uh, and we were in business again. <laughs> right? now, uh, now, there was a problem. <laughs> and this time, I couldn't go to the grocery store and get wormwood. So wormwood is the stuff you make absinthe out of. It's this weird herb that 
They used to use to cure tapeworms 400 years ago, but today it really has no practical use. It's this horribly bitter, nasty stuff. And other than making absinthe, no one has a reason to have it, right? So I had to find somewhere you could buy wormwood. So, you know, obviously back to the internet again, and lots of searching. And that took me to a witchcraft supply store. <laughs> um, which, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was legitimately one of the more terrifying experiences. <laughs> you know, I, I was too young to know this isn't real, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, so, so I got my tub of wormwood and, uh, and made absinthe, and that was good. Um, you know, we, this, this was fantastic. You know, I could throw parties now, and uh, the girls would all come over with peacock feathers in their hair, and the guys would put on top hats, and everyone would party like it was 1899. <laughs> um, so I thought this was really cool, and I kept doing it for several years, and then I went and got a job, and then went back to college, and sort of floated around for a while. And then later, I went to Burning Man, and, uh, and I realized pretty quickly that the best part about Burning Man is these art cars, right? So, you can hop up on the upper decks and drink and ride around on the things, checking out the whole show for you know, hours and hours and hours, and it's fantastic and fun. The problem is everyone else has figured this out too. And so every time you stop, there's a great big long line that forms to get on them. And pretty much the only people that are going to get on are topless girls. <laughs> but <laughs> if you have a backpack full of absinthe, <laughs> you, you suddenly become the topless girl. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so for several years, I was known as the absinthe guy at Burning Man. <laughs> um, and then I thought, well, wow, if all these people are into this, and I think this is cool, maybe there's like a pot of gold here. So I thought maybe I can make this into a, a business and actually do this for a living. So uh, my business partner, Joanne, and I, um, we moved to Spain, where absinthe was legal. Um, <laughs> and created what might well be one of the worst ever business plans possible. <laughs> um, I mean, so first off, we didn't speak Spanish. Second, we didn't understand the local customs. Third, most of the Spanish authorities weren't aware that absinthe was legal in Spain, so you had to explain it to them, which was, you know, I mean, there were, the problems abounded, right? And we should have been bankrupt in about two months, really. But, you know, we had the internet. By now, we're to Google. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so we went to Google and asked it all kinds of good questions, like how to hire a lawyer in Spain. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or how to speak Spanish. <laughs> that seemed to be important. And, uh, and also, it seemed to be harder. You couldn't just read it off of Google and figure it out, which was a problem. Uh, so we had to come up with an alternative, which was how to load Babelfish onto your pocket PC. Um, for those of you who are younger, the pocket PC was this sort of really primitive iPhone. Um, so there's, the, uh, there's my pocket PC, which I carted all over Spain, um, you know, typing in whatever it was I needed and handing it to the real estate agents or something and then watching them fall off of their chair laughing. Um, <laughs> So this actually kind of worked out because the US decided to legalize absinthe right after we did this. And so we were able to get a little bit of funding, and we were natives to American culture, which the other producers weren't for the most part. And so uh, we were a little bit shrewder in that sense. We had the disadvantage of being vastly underfunded and in our early 20s, but we were still able to end up with the number four absinthe brand in the United States, um, which was pretty cool. And, uh, and so at this point, we got into all these great conversations with huge, you know, multi-billion dollar companies that are wanting to buy us, and they're, you know, taking you out to fancy dinners and all of this other neat, awesome stuff, and you're in your early 20s, and you've got a multi-million dollar budget, and this was like an awesome party, right? And, uh, and then the consumer market in the U.S. kind of like, you know, a few years later went, well, okay, absinthe was fun and all, but we've kind of done that now, and we're sort of over it, right? Like, we did this once, that's, that's enough. Um, and so the, uh, the market pretty much crashed. <laughs> and, uh, so we sold the distillery to some local people in Spain, moved back to the US, and said, OK, well, you know, let's do something else. So uh, the next plane ticket we had was to Las Vegas uh, at the point when we sold the distillery. So we just got off the plane there, rented a condo, bought a car, you know, and went like, OK, we'll figure it out from here, right? And, uh, and so we did the natural thing. We called all our distributors. We said, like, hey, guys, you know, what do you need? What does the market want, right? 
And, uh, and the response we got back from them was a little bit of a problem, because we figured we'd build a new distillery and leverage all of our contacts and things we had picked up before. And the distributor said, well, no, actually, we really don't want anything a new distillery can make. You know, there's 450 new distilleries in the US, and we don't need vodka, because we've got too many producers making vodka, and we don't need gin, we've got too many of those too. What we really need is, you know, barrels. <laughs> um, you know, whiskey, 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 or maybe some aged rum or some aged brandy in that mix. And, and this was a problem, so I naturally did the same thing I always do whenever I run into a problem, which is I went back to Google. <laughs> I said, how do I age booze fast? <laughs> um, and this was a new experience because, uh, you know, the answer I got back from Google was, you need a time machine. <laughs> um, like, hey, hello, McFly. Um, this, this can't be done. And, uh, and so I went back to Google again, and I said, OK, well, let's start maybe a little few steps back. What happens to booze when it ages in a barrel? You know? What are the chemical reactions that are taking place inside that barrel, and why is that changing the product? And what I got back from Google was mud. So I use this map as a fun example, because if you look up on the left, this was drawn before the United States had been explored. And so you can see they followed all the rivers and tributaries, um, but they never got inland, and so they just drew pretty pictures to take up the space that was missing. Um, not unlike booze marketing. <laughs> so uh, so the, the bottom line here was that I had actually found an outer edge of Google. You know, I'd found this place where whatever you asked Google, you got back conflicting answers, or you got back, you know, mud, or these strange, obscure statements like the whiskey oxidizes in the barrel. And you're going, well, wait a minute, what, what are you talking about? There's 600 molecules in whiskey. What's oxidizing and what's it turning into? And you just don't get an answer, right? And so this was a great lesson for me because this is how you find out when you've hit the outer edge of human knowledge. It right? is where, where Google can't answer the question. You just get junk. <laughs> um, and so I went ahead and got to work on running five years' worth of experiments all kinds of tests, taking every piece of conventional wisdom that you could find uh, in the world of how whiskey is matured, and then testing each one of the different pieces, figuring out how many of them were utter crap that someone had made up 20 years ago and it just kept getting repeated. Um, and fast forward to today, this is actually our first commercial time machine. Um, that's called Thea One, and uh, she's getting installed next week for the very first time. And we have roughly 10% of the world's distilled spirits producers on our waiting list. So we're actually, uh, <laughs> yay Google. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, it's fun because we're actually most likely, if this all works out, going to be the barrel in the future, which is, uh, which is a fun thing to do. So then I got this other revelation, right, which is um, old people can't do this. So I had this opportunity recently to work with a really smart older PhD, um, super cool, awesome chemist guy. And we're trying to solve different problems, and we're working on computers side by side, and we're looking stuff up. And I stopped working with him pretty quickly because I realized this was futile. He may know way more than I do when he sits down at the computer, but he doesn't know how to intuitively find his way through the search functions to get to the answer that he's looking for. He just sort of wanders for hours you know, trying to find the answer because he didn't grow up with these machines. Right? So I'm the first generation of kids that grew up with a computer. And, uh, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Um, and so I did a little bit of searching and said, well, how old are people typically when they discover stuff? Right? And this was the answer that you get from the Kellogg School of Management, which seems fairly credible. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty interesting, because what you notice on here pretty quickly is that kids don't tend to invent things. It, it tends to be grown-ups um, between 30 and 50 and probably concentrated at the later 30s and the early 40s. And then if you look at you know, using Nobel laureates in chemistry, which is an easy group to search, right? Not to try to put myself in that bucket. <laughs> OK, I make booze. <laughs> um, but what you find is that today, post-1985, your typical Nobel laureate in chemistry is age 46 at the point where they make their research that's groundbreaking. And so it gives you an idea of how old your native computer users need to be when they get to the point that they can search truly effectively and use the incredible new resource that we just sort of willed into this world you know, not very long ago. And so that obviously brings me to my concluding and ending question, which is, what happens when this kid grows up? Cool. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs>